So before we start with the main presentation, I wanted to just tell you about some of the bells and whistles we have with us. There are still some copies left of this Banff handbook from 1996 and uh, with the forward by me from 2022. And uh, this was uh, the document that we used for the negotiation for CCTT for creating the Banff 97 classification. And I also have a copy of Sam Kaner's book from 1997. Uh, if you're interested in that, Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision-Making. Yeah. And you, you can see it's kind of comical in here where he talks about incorporating troublemakers. It's a term we don't use. And finally, some of you may have been looking forward to seeing my new Tesla Model Y. And I do have it, but I don't have it here in Banff because I'm receiving a Banff of big painting that will only fit in my Toyota Highlander. So that's why I brought the Highlander to the meeting. Okay, and now we're going to the PowerPoint. Whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Report from the early days of Banff. I have no disclosures. That quote from our editorial in 2021 in KI, whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Many of the most important bold moves in Banff were moves by women. And there should be an effort to honor the women of Banff and probably the leadership of Banff will become majority female in the future. Alex Lupi has suggested that and I strongly support that and predict that. And for those of us who were there at the beginning in the 1990s, most important bold move of that era is at the top of our Google Scholar profile. That is the 97 meeting report, 1997 meeting report. This was negotiated by myself and Bob Colvin, but Lorraine Rackison was a co-equal partner in that process. And she wrote the paper and is its first author. And the paper is timeless and a citation classic. Yeah. So this is the way my Google Scholar page looks at the top and other people, um, of a similar era, it would be very, very similar to this. At the Banff 97 paper is always at the very top because that had many more citations than any of the other Banff meeting reports. And you can see all the other top papers there are also from Banff. So we owe a great debt of gratitude to Lorraine, we benefited enormously from the high quality of that paper and her continued devotion to the Banff process throughout the decades. And we also owe a special thanks to Bob Colvin, a true gentleman to negotiate with, process of negotiating. The Banff 97 classification was fun and productive and we benefited enormously from the high quality of the negotiations in the beginning and Bob's continued devotion to the Banff process throughout the decades. Now, on December 6, 2021, I received a Halloran lightning bolt out of the blue. 
And Phil asked me this question, who identified tubulitis as a marker of TCMR? I learned about it from you. It is a fundamental discovery. It outperforms many of the gene transcript sets as a predictor, Phil said. So as many of you know, in my office, I have many editions of Captain Stahl, and I poured over those. And very interesting, in that era of 1966 to 92, there is no mention of tubulitis. The Kendrick Porter chapter mentioned finding lymphocytes in the urine in rejection, but tubulitis was not described. He talked about finding bigger lymphocytes uh, at peaks of rejection and so on, but very little apparent interest in what the lymphocytes were doing in the tubules. Yeah. So the first person to describe tubulitis was Victor Pollock in 1975 in native interstitial nephritis. And then he taught many other people about the concept of tubulitis, including Dick Sibley. Sibley has the first article um, using that term in the transplant literature but it erroneously indicates that the lymphocytes are in tubular cytoplasm, which does not happen or hardly it ever happens. So he, he sort of missed the basic concept of what the tubulitis lesion is. That was in 1983 and 1984, Regina Varani had a vague um, description of, of uh, tubulitis in the transplanted kidney. And finally, we in 1985 uh, described it uh, accurately and as it is currently understood. Mononuclear cells lying between tubular epithelial cells or beneath them just inside the tubular basement membrane. So the fundamental discoveries of the BAMF classification were foreshadowed. The clinical trials of cyclosporin between the mid 1970s and early 1980s. In 1983, cyclosporin received FDA approval. And that year, Jim Burdick, surgeon Jim Burdick at Johns Hopkins and I started a protocol biopsy study of cyclosporin treated patients biopsied at one and four weeks. And in 1985, we published paper describing tubulitis in those biopsies. This then became the crucial backdrop against which the BAMP classification was created six years later. This graphic and the ones shown previously are by University of Montreal pathology resident, Ching Yin Wang. Okay, so in the first BAMP classification paper from the 1991 meeting, published in 1993 in KI. Editor Tom Andrilli thought the specificity of tubulitis for acute TCMR and the non-specificity of the interstitial inflammatory infiltrate was so important that everything about it should be put on the first page of the manuscript, and that was done. His argument was many people don't get beyond the first page, so you want to be sure that that information crucial to their understanding is there on the first page. And this is the way that paragraph looks. It begins and ends with tubulitis. And we describe the non-specificity of interstitial infiltrates in 1984 and the specificity of tubulitis in 1985. Today and into the future, tubulitis remains just as important as ever. It figured prominently in the three articles in the March 2022 issue of AJT with cover graphic acute T cell mediated rejection, still a worthy opponent. And for decades, tubulitis has been the focus of morphometry programs. And so now the best machine detection systems 
use a combination of handcrafted features, texture, texture analysis, and machine learning. And you can see that in the recent March and May 2022 Banff Digital Pathology Working Group videos on our website with uh, Ulysses Bayless demonstrating these features. The success of the Banff classification resulted in the adoption of biopsy proven rejection as an endpoint in clinical trials and of identifying a central pathologist for those trials. 30 years ago in 1992, clinical trials began with mycophenolic acid with me as the central pathologist for the next three decades. I saw three to seven times more biopsies from clinical trials than I did from local patients with many different clinical trials for different compounds, there were informal educational uses of the digital images for fellow training in 2010 and 2019 when the fellow and I were in the same room. But only this year, 2022, have we included such teaching, been able to incorporate it into formal contracts. It took 30 years to accomplish that. And I'm, I'm very happy we now have done it. We cannot identify the clinical trials involved, just a clinical trial. The rebel spirit was evident early on in Banff with heckling at the USCAP first presentation of the Banff schema in 1992. This is a dolly image of that event. And I'm pretty sure there were no pictures of it, but dolly can give you a pictures of anything you can describe. And my father was there because I thought it was a kind of significant moment in my career. He was a car cardiologist. He was fascinated by the heckling, said nothing like that ever occurred in cardiology. So it seemed like uh, something really interesting. So you might have expected a falling out after this, but exactly the opposite occurred. A Agnes Fogo became one of my closest friends. There are many pictures of my wife and me doing things with her over the years. This is in 1998. And uh, here we are in 1999 with Larry Hunsaker and once again with Larry. And then in 1999, you see her hiking. And we'll come back to this picture toward the end of the presentation because something else happened in that same area in uh, 2012 in August. Yeah. So you might um, have also thought of other people. So by 20, 2001, um, Bob Colvin was regularly joining us. And here are the four of us uh, socializing together. Yeah, so Agnes was most often the person who got discussions unstuck when they were at an impasse. Bob and Larry also did that. However, that alone does not completely explain my enthusiastic embrace of the rebel voice. Why was I so keen on that? To fully understand that, you need to know about Gary Green, shown here at top, and Michelle Hale shown at the bottom. This is also described in greater detail in my September 9th video that talks about how grateful we are to the National Kidney Foundation for the financial support provided in those first 10 years from 97 to 2007. So, the reason for our enthusiasm was that, in a sense, Michelle and I were rebels too. She took a um, mentoring course, uh, a mentoring experience provided by the University of Alberta, the young entrepreneurs. And they analyzed the situation that NKF cyber nephrology was in. So we had a page in the National Kidney Foundation website, but not very many people access that page. And so it appeared that we would be much better off 
we had our own website. So Michelle was impressed by this argument and she independently without telling anyone um, found a company to create the website, created the website, showed it to me and then described the situation and the recommendation that had come from her mentor um, in this university program for young entrepreneurs. And I realized this would make Gary Green a bit uncomfortable because he was sort of at the interface between John Davis, the CEO of the National Kidney Foundation, and me. This made it look like we were not entirely happy with the page that represented us in the main NKF website. So I, I would say though that that website that we created had many potent effects, one of which was this idea that you may have noticed in the other September 9th video, the oddest thing described there was the proposal that I should head NKF cyber nephrology in per perpetuity, that is forever, and also the ISN Informatics Commission, and uh, that suggestion, I think, came about because this website suggested that we could go independent if the NKF cut us loose, we could find funding from somewhere else. And, and indeed, that's what happened. So in 2007, we let the highly paid professional staff go, started in with student staffing, which has benefited the students very much. And that's how. NKF cyber nephrology has proceeded ever since. So I think that's the reason that Michelle and I were enthusiastic about other rebellious people because we had a bit of a rebellious streak ourselves. Yeah. So finally, a word about consensus generation styles, which will be part of what Mark Haas talks about next. Sam Kaner has a book on the subject with four editions, the first in 1996, the fourth in 2022. But uh, in my opinion, we have consistently been ahead of him throughout the decades. For instance, in the 1996 edition I happen to have with me, he's talking about incorporating troublemakers into your process. <laughs> We didn't really think there were troublemakers in Banff. We called them spirited debaters, much better term. And they're part of our past and our future. Long live the rebel spirit. This graphic from Dali shows the idea of there's always something to look forward to. And that's how I feel and what my life experience has taught me thus far. It's not that you peak and then it's downhill from there. There is no peak. Yeah, and a final word about how we cannot go home again. In 1999, Agnes Fogo waited in Cavell Pond, the base of Mount Edith Cavell in Banff. And 13 years later, the overhanging glacier, it's, it's, it's unusual, you can see, could see the underside of the glacier as well as the top. 60% of that ghost glacier came crashing down into Cavell Pond in the early morning of August 10th, 2012, when no one was in the park. It took six years to repair the damage and reopen that part of the park. And it basically completely ob obliterated um, uh, Cavell Pond. And so it, it, it's kind of a metaphor for things that we should not try to revisit. So we cannot do something new like the xenotransplantation pathology classification using old ways. I begin, I, I agree entirely with Alex Lupi that it needs a precision medicine and machine learning approach. And I, I think that's gonna turn out very, very well. And I'm excited to see how 
they move forward with that. Yeah, so that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. That's it.